Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Athlete's Foot. The crowd of schoolchildren surged to its feet as the runner swept around the final bend into the home straight. Anthony St. John Smythe was in the lead, his long, elegant legs pulling him away from the rest of the field, his floppy blonde hair streaming out behind him, his arrogant smile plastered across his pink face like a wet peach slice in a round bowl of strawberry blancmange. He breasted the tape and raised his hands to acknowledge the cheers. He was All England School's champion for the fourth year in a row, and he was the best. And he knew it too. A line of puce-faced panting athletes straggled in behind him. Limp and exhausted, they flopped over the finishing line and lay down to catch their breath. Whilst out on the track, a lone, baggy, shorted figure in black elasticated gym shoes padded on. Oliver Littlebody was the runt of the race, a sparrow of a boy with thin spindly legs and he still had 200 yards left to run. The crowd laughed as he wound up his rubbery limbs and sprinted for the line like a flat-footed ostrich, arms flapping, knees knocking and cheeks puffing from the effort. With twenty yards to go, he tripped over his own feet and sprawled across the track in front of the grandstand. Anthony St. John Smythe broke off from his lap of honour and ran over to Ollie's side, where he pretended to count him out like a boxing referee. A one, a two, a three, he mocked, much to the crowd's delight. The inside of Ollie's bottom lip stung where the cinder track had cut him, but he was no quitter. Fighting back tears of humiliation, he struggled to his feet and staggered over the line. You're useless, Anthony whispered in his ear. I don't know why you bother to turn up. Cause one day I'm gonna beat you, gasped Ollie. You couldn't beat a tortoise on crutches sneered Anthony. Dream on, matchstick boy. Then he rushed back to his adoring female fans who had leapt over the barriers to get him to autograph their t-shirts. Ollie cut a despondent figure as he trudged down the tunnel towards the changing rooms. An old man leant over the wall of the stand and tapped him on the shoulder with his walking stick. Well, Ron, he said. Ollie stared at him blankly. Either this man was blind, or he'd mistaken Ollie for someone else. Well, I ran like a three-legged donkey, he said. But the stranger disagreed. You showed real guts out there today. I once knew a boy ran just like you. He was All England School's champion back in the forties. The old man chuckled. Tommy Knocky's name was. Best quarter miler this country ever produced. Well, I've never heard of him, said Ollie. Nobody has, said the old man. He was killed during the war before he had a chance to prove himself. Ollie didn't know which war he was talking about, and besides, his legs ached, so he said, Oh, and left it at that. He was a friend of mine, the old man remembered sadly. Ollie sucked his sore lip. So let's make a deal. What? said Ollie, surprised by this sudden change of tack. If your parents agree to it, you give me half an hour of your time every day for a year, and I'll teach you how to beat Anthony St. John Smythe. What, me? Run faster than God's gift to Lycra? No way. I said beat him, repeated the old man. This time next year. But he just duffed me up like a snail. Well, you can't win every time, said the old man wisely. Well, Anthony St. John Smythe does, came Ollie's acid retort. Then it's up to you to beat him. The old man laid down the gauntlet for Ollie to pick up, but the boy hesitated. 
He wasn't sure. Who was this weird old man, and what exactly did he want? Ollie turned for some answers, but the old man had disappeared. All Ollie could hear was the tap-tap of the old man's walking stick and the click of the rusty iron turnstile as he let himself out of the stadium. The next day, after school, when Ollie turned up to meet the old man, the stadium was empty, except for one lonely runner sprinting round and round the track, like a hamster on a wheel. I knew it, he mumbled to himself. He isn't coming. He doesn't think I can beat Anthony St. John Smythe either. He rested his chin on his hands and studied the athlete on the track. What Ollie wouldn't have given to run like that? fat chance now. It was time to go home, but just as he turned to leave, the runner called out his name and ran over to greet him. You came, said the old man. Ollie was astonished. The old man was even weedier than he was, with a concave body like a dried-out rat and scrawny legs that stuck out the bottom of his baggy shorts like bonsai twigs. Was that really you, sprinting round the track like an Olympic champion? he asked. The old man smiled modestly. But you're, well, you're... Old? stated the old man. You noticed. There are secrets in this world, Oliver, that even you don't understand. There was a twinkle in his roomy eye. Now, I believe we had a deal. I'm going to teach you to beat Anthony St. John Smythe. Shall we begin? The old man bent down and unlaced his black leather running spikes. I want you to start by running round the track as fast as you can, he said. I'll time you. What now? asked Ollie. Now, said the old man. Ollie did as he was told, completing the 400 metre circuit in just under two and a half minutes. See? He puffed. Pathetic. I'm not built to run fast. But the old man didn't seem bothered. He ignored Ollie's whinging and handed him his running shoes. Now, try it in these, he said. The leather was hard and cracked and as black as charcoal. Ollie struggled to squeeze his feet inside. Oh, I can hardly walk, he complained as he hobbled around on the grass. It's like wearing clogs. But you don't have to walk, do you? said the old man. Try running in them, Oliver. Once round, I'll time you again. I'll be lucky to get off the starting blocks, grumbled Ollie as he tiptoed painfully over to the track and stood on his marks. On your marks! Get set! Go! shouted the old man, and Ollie set off. An extraordinary feeling, like the shoes were alive, like they were hovering over the track on a cushion of air, like there were rockets in his heels. His puny legs were pumping like steam pistons as the shoes flashed him up the back straight and cruised round the top bend. Ollie had never run so fast in his life. His feet had never been this hot either. It was like running on burning coals. Then suddenly, there it was, the finishing line. The shoes accelerated over the last 50 metres and skipped Ollie home in a new lap record of 46 seconds flat. Ollie's feet were gently smoking as the old man limped up to him. Now do you believe me? he grinned. In those shoes you can knock Anthony St. John Smythe for six. Ollie was still trying to catch his breath. But why? he asked. What's so special about these shoes? They belong to a friend of mine, said the old man. Oh, he's not a dead friend by any chance, is he? The old man raised an eyebrow. Who died in the war? They belong to Tommy Knock, confirmed the old man. As a matter of fact, he was wearing them when he died. What, you mean he died running? During the war, said the old man cryptically. One day I'll tell you his story, but right now we've got some training to do. Training? scoffed Ollie. There's no need to train if I've got magic shoes. Quite right, applauded the old man. 
but this is special training. What weights, you mean? No, shopping, said the old man, producing a scrap of paper from one pocket and a five-pound note from the other. I want you to go to the supermarket and buy these items. Oh, I see, said Ollie. You put me on a special diet. No, you buy my supper. Baked beans on toast. Ollie didn't want to appear ungrateful or anything, but he was under the impression that this old man was going to teach him how to run faster than any other human being in the history of the world, not how to go shopping. Well, the deal is your mine for thirty minutes every evening for the next year. If a running, complained Ollie, to show you how to beat Anthony St. John Smythe, corrected the old man, and I've already done that. But shopping, I'm an old man, Oliver. I walk with a stick. You're young and fit, it seems a perfectly fair swap to me. Ollie felt like he'd been cheated, but the last thing he wanted was the old man to walk off with the magic shoes. He accepted the deal on one condition. Do you promise the boots will always run as fast as they did just now? You have my word on that, said the old man. Tommy Knock never ran a bad race in his life. The boots simply repeat whatever happened to him. That's their magic. Well, and, and Tommy Knock was the All England Schools champion, wasn't he? In 1940, yes. What about 1941? asked Ollie. But the old man avoided this question. Now run along and get my beans, he said. I'm famished. From then on, their training sessions followed an identical pattern. Ollie would go round to the old man's flat after school to collect a shopping list, some money and occasionally some special offer coupons. He would then get on the bus and go to the local supermarket, where he would buy the old man's dinner. Chicken and mushy peas, coli pie and ketchup, sausages and boiled cabbage, whatever took the old boy's fancy. Back in the flat, Ollie would cook the food, wait while the old man ate it, do the washing up, and then go home. Ollie never complained about his coach's unconventional training methods, but sometimes his face betrayed his disappointment at not being out on the track doing split times and fitness circuits like all the other budding athletes. Whenever this happened, the old man would take Tommy Knox running spikes out of the shoebox in his fridge and let Ollie try them on, promising him that when the new season started, there'd be time enough for Ollie to show the world what he could do in them. The old man was true to his word. The athletic season began in April the following year, and the old man entered Ollie for a succession of races up and down the country. Within a matter of weeks, there were two names on everybody's lips. Anthony St. John Smythe and Oliver Littlebody. Anthony started the season as favourite to retain his championship title, but as time wore on, Oliver's consistently brilliant performances brought the two boys level. His old-fashioned smoking spikes were the talking point of locker rooms and newspaper offices throughout the land. Then one day, an article headlined, By Golly, It's Ollie, appeared in the trade magazine Track and Field Monthly. It hailed Oliver Littlebody as the best 400 metres runner this country had ever seen, better by far than his rival, Anthony St. John Smythe, who by comparison, so the journalist wrote, ran like a gangly puppet with rickets. When Anthony read this, his vain brain boiled over with jealousy. He, and only he, was the champion, and so he would be again, by fair means or foul. Anthony tore the paper into a thousand tiny pieces and ate it. What are you doing? asked his mother. Eating Oliver Littlebody for breakfast, mumbled the redneck schoolboy. I hate the skinny little runt. He's stealing my thunder. Oh, it's those boots of his, said his mother. There's something fishy about them. Well, then I want a pair, stamped the brattish boy wonder. It's not fair. I'm the best. He can't beat me. 
But even though his father spent hundreds of thousands of pounds buying every pair of running shoes ever made, Anthony never found a pair like Ollie's, because Ollie had the only magic spikes in the world. Come the day of the All England Schools Championship, Ollie was the clear favourite, and he was quietly confident that Tommy Knox shoes would steer him to victory. Anthony, on the other hand, was consumed by envy and loathing, and turned up at the stadium with a secret scheme to nobble his rival before the race. Winning was everything to Anthony, no matter how he achieved it. Anthony had already changed into his running strip when Ollie and the old man appeared in the changing room doorway. Anthony smiled as the antique coach pushed his skinny protégé forward. How lovely to see you, Oliver, dissembled Anthony, turning on the charm like Jack the Ripper. Oh, by the way, congratulations on your results this year. You must have been training very hard. Yeah, he has said the old man. Now sit down, Ollie, and get changed. I'll wait for you out on the track. The old man left the changing room as Ollie sat down on the bench and unpacked his kit. Anthony stepped out of the shadows. Those must be your famous running shoes, he said, as Oliver produced Tommy Knox spikes from his sports bag. May I have a look? Well, I'd rather you didn't said Oliver, clutching them tightly to his chest. Scared I might steal them, laughed Anthony. Oliver, really, I've got a brand new pair of my own. I'd hardly want to wear those smelly old things, would I? And he snatched the boots out of Oliver's hands. No, shouted Oliver, give them back. But as he rose to reclaim them, he was yanked back down by an invisible hand on the seat of his trousers. Problem? inquired Anthony slyly. I don't know, trembled Ollie. I think my trousers are stuck to the bench. Oh dear, sympathised Anthony. I wonder how that happened. Anthony, do something, please. They're stuck to my legs as well. I can't take them off. Well, I've got some glue, if that's any help, smirked Anthony, holding up a tube of stick-fast adhesive. Now, on second thoughts, it might just make matters worse. Ollie's mouth fell open, then bitter tears gave way to fury. You cheat, he shouted. You've put super glue on the bench. Well, only a little bit, said Anthony. Now, I really must go. I think I can hear the steward calling our race. Thanks for the spikes, by the way. I think I might just try them out in the final, if it's all the same to you. No, wailed Ollie as Anthony turned and left. No, Anthony! Don't leave me here! But Anthony wasn't coming back. Anthony cut a dash in his matching shorts and singlet as he ran out of the tunnel into the stadium. Tommy Knox's boots pinched him on the heel, but the roar of the crowd anaesthetised the pain, and he bounced over to the stand where the girls were screaming for a stroke of his flowing flaxen locks and bulging brown thighs. While Anthony was having his ego rubbed, the old man was scouring the track for Ollie. There were only a couple of minutes left before the start of the race. Where was he? Then something made him glance down at Anthony's charcoal black running shoes. The old man ran down the tunnel and into the long underground corridor that led to the changing rooms. The tannoy was announcing the 400 metres final and he heard the crowd stamp its feet and cheer above his head. He found Ollie weeping on the bench. Why aren't you changed? he bawled. What are you doing? Well, there's no point any more, blubbed Ollie. I thought you wanted to beat Anthony more than anything in the world, said the old man. Now's your chance. You won't get another. He's got Tommy's shoes, Ollie wailed. Good, exclaimed the old man. I was going to give them to him anyway. Now come on. He yanked Ollie off the bench, tearing a huge gaping hole in the back of the boy's trousers. What do you mean you were going to give Tommy Knox shoes to him anyway? Whose side are you on? Trust me, said the old man, pushing Ollie towards the exit. But the boy resisted. Look, 
Oliver, you wouldn't have won if you'd worn those shoes today. So what was all the training about, gawked Ollie? You tricked me into doing your shopping for a year. I made you believe you could beat him, and it's worked, you can. But you've got to run the race to do it. Not without Tommy Spikes, bellowed the bewildered boy. Why had the old man suddenly changed his tune? I, I want to win, not make a complete laughing stock of myself like last year. Then get out there and compete, shouted the old man. The tannoy was calling the runners to the track. No, said Ollie, not until you tell me why you've gone back on your word. Magic is never straightforward, Oliver. What seems simple on the surface often carries a hidden danger. If the boots can make you run like Tommy Knock, they can also make you die like him. Ollie didn't understand. Well, so how did he die? After the race, said the old man. Now get moving. And he physically propelled Ollie out of the changing room. But what about my kit? squealed the boy. No time, said the coach. You run as you are. Ollie stumbled out of the tunnel in his trousers and string vest. The crowd roared as he appeared, only this time with laughter as he tried to cover the hole in the seat of his pants. Ignore them, said the old man. Concentrate on the race. Please tell me why Anthony's got the spikes on, begged Ollie for the last time. Because I knew Tommy Knock, said the old man mysteriously. And with that, he pushed the small barefoot boy onto the track. Anthony St. John Smythe smirked at Ollie as they knelt into their starting blocks. Thanks for the spikes, he mocked. See you at the losing post. Then the starter raised his arm and the crack of the starting pistol catapulted the runners from their blocks. Ollie rose with Anthony and entered the first bend on his shoulder. But Tommy Knock's magic spikes quickened Anthony's stride and pulled him away from the rest of the field. Ollie struggled to stay with him, but his legs were weak from no training, and the harder he tried, the slower he ran. As Anthony accelerated into the final bend, Ollie threw an accusing look at the old man. No words were needed. Ollie hated his coach for making him look such a fool, and he hated him twice for standing there smiling and pointing up at the sky. It wasn't funny. Ollie could kill him. Up ahead, Anthony was surfing into the home straight, winning by a mile. Where was the old man's magic now? Suddenly, the stadium shook to the deafening roar of a thousand throbbing prop engines. A dark cloud swept across the grandstand and plunged the track into shadow. Ollie looked up at the sky, expecting to see a squadron of low-flying aircraft. But there was nothing there, just the droning and the whistling. The high-pitched whistling that a bomb makes as it rushes to the ground. The old man was jumping up and down now, cheering. Anthony was twenty metres from the tape, and Ollie was beaten. Or was he? The whistling stopped, the crowd fell silent, and then with an almighty bang, an invisible bomb exploded on the track right in front of the lead runner. There was a white flash as Tommy Knox's running shoes were blown off Anthony's feet. They sizzled through the air like two flaming black crows and somersaulted back to earth beside a neat pyramidic pile of St. John's ashes. The race for first place was back on. Ollie came seventh. So how did Tommy Knock die? He asked the old man after the medals had been presented and the ceremony of the dustpan and brush had swept Anthony St. John Smythe off the track. In 1941, during the 440 final in the All England Schools Championship, he was hit on the head by a German bomb. What, you mean Anthony? Blown to smithereens, Oliver. Copped a ghostly Luftwaffe whizbang right between his ears. Blimey, gasped Ollie. 
That's powerful magic, that is. Ah, it certainly is, said the old man. It would have been you if you'd been wearing the spikes. Ollie gulped. Poor old Tommy Knock. We'll never see his like again. What about me? asked Ollie. The old man chuckled. I don't think so, Oliver. You'll never be a runner. You'll be a good chap. Well worth knowing, I mean, the shopping proved that. But as for speed, I'd leave that to the tortoises from now on. They've got the edge. The stringy boy grinned. He was pleased he didn't have to run any more. Uh, there is just one thing I'd like to know, he said. Tommy not being blown up. He didn't suffer, did he? The old man took Ollie's hand and looked him straight in the eyes. Strange thing was, he said, I didn't feel a thing. Then he just disappeared in a puff of blue smoke in much the same way as he disappeared 50 years before.